This is a bombshell, what she dropped yesterday, Ashley Merchant, that he alleged in his divorce proceeding that he did not have any extramarital affair during the time of his marriage, and he didn't file for divorce until November 2nd, 2021. And then when this whole issue came up in the Trump case, he went back and amended that interrogatory, that sworn interrogatory answer, to plead the fifth, to plead the fifth. I mean, just that alone seems like a rather significant development. What do you make of it? Well, it's a very significant development. Mike Davis was right um, when he said that to you that uh, you don't get to play games with the court like this. Like you don't get to make a bunch of representations and then you say, ah, I think I'm going to take the fifth, right? So what what a court will normally do, Megan, I had this come up one time in a uh, in a criminal case where we had a defendant who took the stand and decided to give his whole side of the story. And then when we got up to cross-examine him as the government, he took the fifth. <laughs> um, and the court, you know, the idea was he was, uh, he knew that it was one of these long, complicated trials that we weren't going to get a mistrial in the middle of it. It was a month's long trial. Um, so what the court ruled is that he had waived his Fifth Amendment privilege and therefore Every time he tried to take the fifth on cross-examination, the court held him in contempt. So I think by the time cross was over, it was somewhere between like 75 and 150 times the court had, had found him uh, in contempt. Um, and I think what you would have if you had a, you know, a real judge would be something akin to that. I think uh, – Nathan Wade is going to be told if he's pressed on it, and we'll have to see how all this testimony shakes out tomorrow, that by the disclosures he's already made in connection with that form, he waived his Fifth Amendment privilege, um, and he's got to testify. And He's he going to testify, to take right? Fifth, because he, he tried, like the divorce proceeding is wrapping up, I'm sure, because of all this. So, you know, he's not being... T- cross-examined in the context of the divorce proceeding. It's in the context of this proceeding where he's now found his tongue. Now he's like, oh, I swear it didn't happen before November, 2021. So I don't know. It's it's more like just an anomaly and a weirdness. I don't think he's going to plead the fifth amendment. I think it's just something to point out. You misled under yeah. oath in your earlier proceeding. Why should we believe you now? When you're changing your story again. But but I do think that the fact that she's, Ashley Merchant's going to call, call this witness, this Bradley, who was representing the guy, but was also his friend and is going to testify in his capacity as the friend. Look, these guys were together long before November, 2021. And unlike Fanny and Nathan has no dog in this hunt, could be devastating. It could be, um, it should be. Especially though, and this is the thing that drives me nuts about this. This is so, it's salacious. It's interesting. Uh, It goes to the ethics and honesty of these people. It calls into question the origins of the investigation. All that's true. It's so far afield from what's wrong with this case. I mean, Mm -hmm. you know, if you think about it, it's related to what's wrong with this case in the sense that there's... Well, there's allegation after allegation after allegation in this case that Trump and the people around him made representations that they knew to be untrue. And now we have prosecutors who, in the things that are more that are of importance to them in their own lives, they look you in the eye and say one thing, and it turns out that it's not true. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't know how they credibly carry a case like this. But, you know, just big picture wise, as I was listening to your discussion, um, a, a few moments ago, it just occurs to me that, you know, she's already, Fannie Willis has already been disqualified from prosecuting one subject in this investigation for conduct that isn't even close to as serious as the kind of stuff that we're talking about now. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the allegation was she headlined a fundraiser for this guy's Democratic opponent in the lieutenant uh, governor race in Georgia. For that, she got disqualified from being able to prosecute this guy. We're talking like dimensions more serious uh, at this point. But to me, the important thing is this case has been like catastrophically ill-conceived from the first. And now if I'm looking at this as a federal prosecutor, you, you mentioned before that I was thinking of this in terms of like 
Is she does she have criminal liability? I wasn't even thinking about perjury. What I was thinking about was fraud, basically. You know, there, there's uh, federal statutes that basically say if you have a, a, a state uh, agency that's funded even modestly by the federal government, and if you make misrepresentations or confer, con, convert property to your own use, um, that's prosecutable fraud. So if, for example, she went to uh, Fulton County and said, I need money to clear up the the uh, backlog from COVID, and then she slices off a piece of that to pay this guy who is her turns out to be her boyfriend with whom she's having an affair, and then they go traveling around the world on the money, that's fraud. You know, that's mm -hmm. a that's a big misrepresentation. Um there's there's federal statutes that apply to that. There are state statutes that apply to that. And what I what I can't uh, avoid saying is delicious about all of it is th those statutes, for the most part, happen to be RICO predicates in federal oh, law. Wow. Um, wow. You know, I think that a competent federal prosecutor would look at it and say, well, we're not going to turn this into like the RICO of all time. We prosecute it as a fraud case. But that goes to everything wrong that she's done in this case. She doesn't you know, she tried to come up with a conspiracy that she could charge all 19 of these people with because she's got 19 people. They're all disparate little groups of people, right? The only thing they've ever done together is get indicted. I think most of them <laughs> don't even like know each other, right? It's so not exactly the like uh, the Gambino crime family, like working together to make well, sure that the family business stays in intact. That is exactly the point. I mean, what she tried to do, she has this thing where the one thing you could arguably say they all agreed on is that they want to undo the result of the 2020 election. The problem she has is that's not a crime. Like every yeah. state has a procedure where you can challenge the election, right? Well, so and then not only that, the but then by, if that's the standard, Maria Bartiromo should be indicted. You know, like we could go down the list of Trump supporters who had questions about the election who could be get indicted if that's all that was required. All right, wait, I want to steer back to the this case though because yeah. we're we're spending some time today on the alleged lies told in the pleadings for good reason. But the, you know, the underlying problem is the financial benefit that she received. And I do think it matters that it, it appears to have been a 10 to one share it, at best with him paying for her rides and so on her vacations. Is there, do they wiggle out of this by saying money? You know what? It was, it was my money. Like I, how do you say it's the taxpayer's money? I, I had money coming into this. It's not necessarily taxpayer money. And she paid for some meals here and there. So what's the problem? Yeah, I think what a judge would tell a jury is that um, what the sharing arrangement is that they refer to, you know, the niceties of how they characterize it are not uh, don't have to be accepted by a jury. Right. You get told, don't check your common sense at the door and you take testimony about exactly what the arrangement was. And if it looks like what happened here substantially is that. She took money that she represented to the county was going to be used for one purpose. She paid this guy six, was it 300000 plus a year? 650000 yeah. Yeah, well, $650,000. She, $650, right, but she only makes like 200000 right? So she's yep. paying him more than she even makes. And what ends up happening is they, after she brings him on and they're paying him this, uh, what's an astronomical amount of money in that office, they start to go here, there, and everywhere, cruises, California, Florida, the Caribbean. Oh my God, Napa. Um, all I, I want to have an affair with Nathan Wade. Right. You get to see the world. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Happy well. Valentine's Day, Doug. The Megan Kelly Show is supported by Grand Canyon University. Founded in 1949, GCU is a private Christian university that's dedicated to delivering an affordable and transformative higher education. Their vibrant campus is located in beautiful Phoenix, Arizona. And according to niche.com, it's ranked a top 25 best campus in the country. As of June, 2023, GCU offers 330 academic programs with over 270 of them online, allowing you the freedom to earn your degree on your time from wherever you are. At GCU, your degree, whether it's a bachelor's, master's or doctorate, integrates the free market system and a welcoming Christian worldview. Learn more about GCU's programs, competitive tuition rates and scholarship offers from your university counselor. They are part of the supportive graduation team 
that takes a personalized approach to helping you achieve your academic goals, walking alongside you every step of the way. Find your purpose at Grand Canyon University. Private, Christian, affordable. For more info or to enroll, visit gcu.edu. Hey, thanks so much for watching. If you like what you just saw, hit the subscribe button for more clips and full episodes.